and it's important for us to then, but he, you got to realize he's assuring these Israelites, this generation, this generation rests, all right? Uh, he, he's assuring them that what you're looking for is there, and you just got to go and, and, and accept it and take it, all right? Uh, and he said, you know, it's exactly there. And then that verses that he gives in there on, on that second page, uh, talking about Deuteronomy 7 through 9, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting thing there. And we're going to look at that with a little bit more depth here uh, in a moment. But he's telling them exactly what is going to happen. Now, how does he know it's going to happen? God told him. All right, you're right. God told him you know, this is what's going to happen. And, and God is in the midst of all of this. And, and he's, you know, the Holy Spirit is in that. And, and God is telling Moses, whispering in his ears like I get whispered in with when my phone rings and I hear it here and you don't hear it, all right? That's the way God works. God is working with us in that, and he was working with them. So he's telling them what exactly is going to happen. He's telling them what they're going to find there, because look what he says. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because I knew this is a question that, that Linda and I were talking about before we got started. Here was his, he didn't choose you because you were more in number, all right? Uh, than any of the people, for you were the fewest of all people. But listen to what he says. There's a big word there. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he had sworn to your forefathers. You see, he's talking about the covenant that God had already had with Abraham and all of the down through the ages. and, and But they had been in slavery. He kept that covenant. And so he's He's there. God loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham and Isaac. And the Lord brought you out of a by a mighty hand. Do you realize coming out of Egypt with Moses leading them out and they're leaving? But what was real amazing was all of the all of the plagues that started falling on Pharaoh in Egypt. Finally, Pharaoh said, You folks get out of here. And Moses had told him, much much told him, that as long as you don't turn them loose, these plagues are going to continue. And so Pharaoh said, get out of here. But then he had a change of mind, and he sent his troops after him before they could get out of there. But anyway, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand, because you realize what he did. Realize what he did for those generation test and generation rest, all right? Uh, the generation rest came about during the 40 years because they were, can you imagine how many births and deaths went on? Well, I bet the midwives were busy. But he says, a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Egypt. And then he says a word there that we have trouble thinking about at times. The word is no, K-N-O-W. No, he says, therefore, that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to what? A thousand generations. But there hadn't been a thousand generations by that time, had there? Are we there yet? <laughs> had there been? No. Well, it's been we hard to imagine, but there may have been because it goes back to 3000 BC. Or, or, so it's there. But that's what he's talking about. And as I got to really looking at that and thinking about it, I want us to just look at those verses in a little bit. We'll get on into what uh, Mark was talking about in his, in his scenarios of it all. But that seventh and eighth verse where he says that he's keeping the oath, and it's not because you were great, he says, and mighty. Uh, I didn't love you because you were great and mighty. So why did God choose them? Now, don't be Quakers now. You get a chance to talk. Because he loved them. Because he loved them, all right? That's true. And, 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 and so that's there. But he chose you, even though you were the fewest in people. And why? And you're right. And the answer to that is God's love for us is not found in any merit that you and I have. This is what Moses is saying to the, to the Israelites, to the generation rest. God has chosen you, not for any merit, 
but solely because of the love and mercy of God. And that, that talks to us today in, in 2024, right? It yeah. says this, that. And then, and he also, it, it, these two verses remind us of God's mercy. And the answer is because God loves us, because God loved the peace of people of Israel. In other words, it wasn't because of any merit of those. It wasn't because of them at all. I mean, they had absolutely nothing to do with it. Did you have a choice of coming into this world? No, I don't think so. <laughs> let me let me, but let me tell you quick, if you didn't have a choice, I want you to know something. No one is an accident. Yeah. Everyone is here because God has a reason for us to be here. And how we got here, it's it. You know, we think about it. But the mercy is, you know, you and I take that truth, that truth that God loves us, uh, he set it upon us, his love initiated and it originated in God, not in us, but in God. God chose us. We didn't choose God. And this is what Moses is letting the Israelites know. Uh, even though they've had all of this taught to them in their homes and everything about it, particularly the Ten Commandments, they had all that taught to them. He says, you take this truth. God loves you. And there's no reason for it at all other than the fact that he chose you. Uh, so take this truth, he says. Think about your life. Think, we think about our lives, all right? Uh, why God has loved me that he has. He loves all of us. And I, why underline, I underline that because to me, all, you know, all your life, uh, commit, if you're a committed person, you, you commit to your job, you commit to your family, you're committed, and that's an expectation, and it's a very good quality of a person. But honestly, to think that, Somebody is committed to me. That God is committed to me. I underline that. I thought, you know. Why? Well, and, and you see, and, and that God making that commitment with us is just like God give, making the covenant with Abraham, the forefathers of this nation and the, and of the Israelites, and He's He's done it with us. In other words, it's a covenant that we have with God. God says, "Here it is. I've loved." You didn't realize you did that when you walked up to the altar and said, Lord, I, I want to become a member of your family or that you were baptized into the faith. That, in essence, is a signal and a sign of your covenant with God and, and that and our covenant said. So when you think it, you know, God loves us. Uh, even though we're sinners, you know, even before uh, we had any merit, but solely because of the love and mercy in God. And this is what verses 7 and 8 are telling us but it also reminds us of God's love uh, he's a God of love and uh, you know go back and you, I wrote this morning about Ephesians but uh, Ephesians 2 8 says this to us it is by grace listen to this now Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus and he's you can realize he said Christ appeared to me on the road to Damascus so he, he knows something about what he's talking about but he says, and he says to the church at, at Ephesus, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God, a gift of God. So no one can boast about it. In other words, you and I didn't do anything to gain it. Yeah, so we're looking at those things and realizing that. So, uh, uh, I mean, we're looking at this, thinking about it. Thoughts? Uh, one of the things that I got to thinking is, and I, you know, it causes us to pray and being overwhelmed by grace. We can say, oh God, we know that no one of us is praying to you right now. In other words, none of us are. That is a relationship, though, that we and I have because of the merit uh, that is in us from God. You know, we can confess all along, but the verse leads us to pray unattached. The ninth verse gets to be even more thin, thinking about it. I'm gonna back up a moment on it. No, that's that word I thought out there, threw out there a while ago. Therefore, that the Lord, by the way, when you read your Bible, do you see the Lord's written in capital letters? Do you know why that is? 
specific. It's meaning Yahweh. All right. So that's when you when you see it written in. It's only in the Old Testament that you see it, but that's where it is. And so that's the covenant. But you know that that we might know Him. Know this, therefore, that the Lord is there. In other words, in other words, what that verse is telling you and me is God gives us the Bible. You have it, right? That's how we got it. God gave it to us. And he gave it to us so that you and I might know him. And we get to know him because of Moses writing the first five and all the other books of the Bible have been written. And so we get to know that. And one of the things that you and I uh, should ask when we read a portion of the Bible is, what does this passage teach me about God? Do you ever stop to think about that when you're reading it? What does it say when you, when I read that word ago, it says, no, therefore, all right? What does that say when God is, is, is teaching me about it? In other words, so much of it is logic. Now, I realize we try to make it deeper than what it really is, and we try to read between the lines. You do that sometimes when you get letters from somebody. And you really want to read between the lines rather than just read what they've written to you. You know, you, you try to do that. We try at times to read between the lines of what God's given us. And when we do, we get into, we get into all sorts of troubles. But the logic that you and I can apply in all this is since God has put this passage, and this is what Moses is saying to the Israelites, God has put you here for a purpose. There it's God. And then, so this passage in the Bible that you and I are reading, and since he's gave us the Bible, all right, that we might know him, then we can know him better through the Bible. That's why we have the study, is to know more about God in the studies that we have and think about it. You see, God gives us himself in his promise. And that's what Moses is saying to the Israelites standing there. God has a purpose for you, and he's promising you he's going to be with you. Yes, you're getting ready to cross the Jordan River. You're getting ready to enter Canaan with all the Canaanites, who have all this crazy culture and all these many gods. And I wrote down something for you on yours. I don't know if you looked at it or not. Joy, Joy debated with me this morning about my a word I use. God reemphasizes that Israel is not set, I mean, Israel is set apart. That means they're holy. And that is a, a Jewish name for ruler, all right, if you're wondering what it is, uh, God, ruler God. And it has this special. But it also, I wrote in the next sentence, I said, he instructs the Israelites to do what? Amen. What does that mean? <clears throat> do you think God would do that? Yes, he did. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> you see, a lot of people don't, a lot of people have not seen the left side of the Bible. Have not, they've only read the right side. They only looked at the New Testament, which was Jesus. And they realized, well, Jesus, you know, he, he was love. the Prince of Peace. He was of love. And, and, but you realize what God was dealing with before and why he even sent his son into the world over all of this. So eliminate, it, it can mean a lot of things. It can just annihilate them. Or you can eliminate them from their culture and bring them into your culture, into the Christian faith. And to God, all right? That could be several things. But God literally says, go wipe them out. They're more numbered than you. And even though 10 of the spies came back and says, oh, they're giants. We can't do anything with them. But Caleb and Joshua says, we can do this. And they did, all right? And so that's what that, that's there. But what I want us to know is that when you and I think about it, know that Yahweh, that's the capital letter Lord, uh, L-O-R-D, Yahweh is our God. He's ours, all right? He is faithful. And when I said, when you see capital letters, Lord in capital letters, that means Yahweh, you are faithful to that. It translates that. So this declaration and recognition of faithfulness to us is fitting at all times. It was fitting when they were getting ready to cross the Jordan River. It's fitting today in the 24, 2024, today in this time, and it's all there. So verse nine says to us, 
starts, it starts right out commanding to know that the Lord is God. All right, it starts that out. All right, he says, know therefore the Lord your God. And that means a lot to us uh, and knowing that. And, and so we, we learn not only is he a sovereign and faithful God, but he is also steadfast in his love and in his covenant keeping with us. In other words, God is a covenant keeping God. The, the mess up of the covenant didn't come from God. It came from the Israelites before the, the generation rest. So Deuteronomy for me is a book that recounts God's glorious ways and material, uh, miraculous deeds that he does for us. And so that's there. His faithfulness to Moses. Do you realize what he was helping Moses with? When we read this and think about it, and we're going to do some more thinking on it here in a moment, Moses was there. In a way from Exodus through Numbers, we find God directing him and having Moses to handle his chosen people. Uh, and, and it's really, it's a reminder of future promises, right? In other words, that promise isn't going to just end with the Israelites. It's going to continue coming on through it all, and we will be there. So because he first loved us and took initiative to make a covenant, God took the initiative to make the covenant, right, in us. You know, we are weak and undeserving sinners uh, as we are, but he chose us as his possession. Thoughts? What were your thoughts about those two Three verses, seven through nine. Anything? Don't be Quakers now. There are no wrong answers. Yes, Dorothy. Well, I'm just, to me, of course, I know the fight. It just says in here, he's a faithful God. Yeah. You know, and yeah. he loves us. That's, you know, to me, me, I don't need any more. I, I read it here, so okay, you know. But now, I know a lot of people don't, but I do. You know, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, what did you? Saying, I'm sorry. Uh, verse what? Well, but I'm actually starting to put it kind of on. When the Lord your God has, when you brought me into the land you promised, and then it goes down and talks about you know all this good stuff was here that you didn't even create, but it was already here. And then when you have eaten and, and where you cannot eat anymore, it says when you are full, don't forget to do reverence to Him. And to serve him and to use his name alone to endorse his promises. I mean, that's just kind why, of why, why do you think? Why do you think he said that about eating? About eating. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> why do you think? Can you imagine what? How, how hungry did they become yeah. in the forty years? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, he had to put manna from heaven. Right. You know, and, and think about it. They'd been in slavery. I'm sure they were taken care of, but they didn't get all the food that they left there. And so now, all of a sudden, you you're you're you you're going to have an empty stomach. Right? I'm, I've been so hungry at times, my stomach has growled as yours. Uh, and so they that was what he was saying to them. Look what's really transpiring. Because when you cross over into the promised land, which is really what land of the what milk and honey. All right, don't overfill yourself. I mean, what happens to people who have have dire thirst and need water? For instance, when you've helped somebody and you've found them and they haven't any water, they want to they want to just go, you know, chug a look. You can't do that. What he's saying is you can't do that with your food. Yeah. In other words, you, if your stomach is been shrunk shrinking because of lack. And now you come and you you, you overeat. Mm -hmm. they, a, they didn't have tums then, all right. <laughs> and and they didn't have gas eggs. They didn't have any Stomach of that. It's not ready for. And, and they weren't ready. Your, your stomach's not ready for it, all right. And you have to slowly come back. I remember being in ICU for twelve days. Wow. Well, I didn't eat for twelve days. Yeah. And when I started coming back, my meals. The hospital was smart. The hospital didn't give me a big bunch of food. I had a little bit of this and a little bit of that. To realizing my stomach in those 12 days, and they were giving me nothing but IVs, shrinks. 
And so if I would have allowed myself, to, but you know the interesting thing about it, I wasn't really starving, but I was hungry. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's yeah. where you're there. So you know, IVs that gave you the necessary. yeah IVs kept me yeah. near there, yeah. but you know, so that's what it was. But I, I did, what did you pick up on the fact, Ben, that he says that we looked at these verses that immediately obvious that Moses is an encourager, yeah. all right? He's not an enabler. He's an encourager. Yeah. There's a difference, right? He could have enabled him and said, oh, you poor little things. I'm here with you. But he didn't. He didn't say that. He said, you got to cross this. And here's what you're going to do. And here's what's there for you. Uh, what did you think about his, his uh, reminiscing of SEAL training? Do you guess he was a SEAL? SEAL. Oh, yeah, he might have been. He knew a lot and, about it. But he knew a lot about it, and, and that's exactly what transpired. You know, begin training, everyone was a raw recruit. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's how raw the Israelites standing there by the Jordan River were. They had no experience in any of this. But Moses was encouraging them and enlightening them, and uh, he wants them to know that every one of them is important. That's, that's an important word for it. How many times do you realize that everybody in this room, everybody in this world, really, is important to God. Absolutely. Now, I realize there are times I look at some of them like God's looking at the Can Canaanites, right? <laughs> I want to eliminate them. And then all of a sudden I realize They're God's I'm not God. I can't be that way. But there are times when you have to, you have to be, unfortunately in our world today, there has to be someone that's stout enough to be brutal in certain scenarios for it to be relinquished. Think about war. We were right? talking about that yesterday and how awful war is, but it must have a, a good reason. But what does the Bible tell us? There will be wars and rumors of wars. You know? So we're going to have them. And, and, and why is it there? But see, there are certain things. It's just like God says, eliminate the Canaanites. What he's saying is, and, and, and it, to essence to me is, he's abundantly clear that the Jews are his chosen people, and I'm going to help you take over this. And this is, this is the land I promised you, and this is what you've got to do to gain it. Uh, and yeah, it's not going to be fun. And yes, there are going to be some who are not going to survive it. How many of us didn't survive the wars, right? And we think of that today. Don't be Quakers on me now. You have thoughts? I, well, I, I like this one. That's, What's that? They don't have any page of numbers, do they? No. I, I, you know what I go and do? I take it and make it chapter 6, page oh, well, 1, 6, okay. one, six okay. 2. Chapter That's what I do. Page 1, page 2, and page 3. All right. This is right here. Most speech here about God's love. Yeah. This is the word frequently used in the Old Testament. It is the word, pronounce that one. Chesed. Chesed. Okay. Chesed. It is not just love, but it's the covenant-keeping faithful love of the one who will not and cannot fail. When God says he loves, it is more than an emotion. It is also a firm, unbreakable commitment. Yeah. Well, you see, yeah. the Jews were like the Greeks. They have a word for it. In other words, we have the word love. All right. Mm -hmm. What did it, what did he just tell you? The word was. It said. He said the thought. There was a gape, wasn't it? Agape well, the Greeks had agape. They had koinonia. Yeah, they had uh, they. There's about five different words for for love in the Greek language. Right. Different kinds of love. I was interesting though. I was reading something on Mark Davis, and he's not only uh, he can only speak English, but he can also. Read Greek and Hebrew, wow. and so and I, I, I admire him because I remember taking Hebrew in seminary, and I had a young rabbi teaching me, Dr. Rabbi Greenstein, and uh, it, it was it was an interesting uh, thing of being able to understand uh, the Hebrew language differently. But but now you know that's a that's a word that's there, Dorothy, and it's a strong word for us today as we think about it. But you got to realize. No matter how good they, the, the, Israel, the Egyptians took care of their Jewish slaves, it was still slavery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the marvelous thing is the, the, the Egyptians did not keep them 
from worshiping their own God. Did you realize that? They didn't, they didn't say you can't do that. All right? There are countries in the world today that says you cannot have a worship of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, they will kill you for that. But he, they were allowed to have their faith and keep it. And that's why there was a certain amount of that family, that familial uh, scenario in the Israelites. Uh, I like what he says that early in Deuteronomy 7, they were given a, a penetrating look at what they will be facing. Do you think that scared them? <laughs> Would it scare you? It would scare me, for sure. You see, the land is occupied by people who think and act and worship differently, very differently. And they think they're right. That's the, you know, you're up against someone that not just going to roll over. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the that's a scenario that we all look at. But you see, here he was, he was encouraging this fledging. And, and I like, you read verse 17 a while ago, didn't you? Candy, was that what you were reading? If you should say in your heart, the nations are greater than I, how can I uh, dispossess them? All right? Think about that. Maybe. Uh, you should not uh, be afraid of them. You should well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. What did he do? He sent plagues. And did not one of, didn't the Pharaoh's son die? And you think about it, wondering about that. What do you think about what you said, the heart is the issue? Heart is the issue. <coughs> the heart is the oh, issue. the heart. Mm -hmm. If you say, uh, say in their hearts, in other words, the word say, he says, uh, means to answer, means a promise, means to boast or to avow that, you know. I mean, who he was is deep down in their heart, and the same thing with us, deep down in our heart, uh, we realize something is different. Did you realize that when you came to Christ, something was different? Yes. You were not the same. You went home, go to school. Yeah. college, everything's different. Yeah, well, how many of us have gone through those experiences in our life? We have a grandson and a granddaughter are about ready to venture out into this world and uh, that's a new one for them but I like what he says every bit of it if their heart really desires the things of God and his plan for them and that speaks for us as well then they will do well we will do well it's all about heart well, you, did you ever sing that song all you really need is heart <laughs> That's it. Any other any other thoughts along that? What did you think about him walking the streets of Chicago? And here he was meeting his bullies. But all of a sudden, what happened? He had a big guy with him. He had a big guy with him. We did this. We did the service. Monday afternoon for Theo. Talk about a big man. He was. Now, I helped lift his coffin out of the hearse oh. onto the beer so that we could roll it down to the front. Ooh. Theo was 6'6", 245 pounds. The casket he was in weighed as much as he did. I'm surprised that he was... You know, able to be that, but to hold his way to keep his way. One guy, one guy wrote on his Facebook that he really, after he met Theo, he understood the song Big John. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting that we'd be there, but it, it, and it was sort of like one of the people that made a witness said that he always he never had to worry because Theo had his back. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> And so, and when when you realize that, who's got our back? God has our back. Jesus. He's got it. So we have it there. Um, 
And so he thinks back on that memory. But think about remember. Uh, the 17th verse said remember, and I was talking about a while ago, uh, and yes, there is a word for it, uh, uh, zakar, and um, it means to remember, um, but it's also to admire. You know, Moses wanted them to remember the, the monumental effort that God made to take them out of slavery in Egypt. Can you imagine that? Yeah. How many, how many people do you think when they started it says, I don't want to go? <laughs> Probably scared to go. Yeah. When we think of that, it's anybody. But you know, but you realize they never walked alone. You know, it's sort of like the song. Right? I, I, I never walk alone. You're not walking alone. And so they weren't alone at the Red Sea and they were not alone here at the Jordan River. In other words, they realize that. But, they, but Moses had to encourage them. How many times, why do you come to church on Sunday morning? To be refreshed and revived for the week. Fill our cup. Do what? Fill our cup. Fill my cup, Lord, yeah. And fill our cups, but we do that for the simple back. It's not that we don't, but that our love for the Lord has slacked off any it's that the fact that we just need to have, be inspired to continue in what we're doing, you know, and what we're about, you know, you know, and it, to learn, yes. and to learn, yeah, yeah. And, and to learn about it. But you, have you ever thought about when when Mark wrote here and he said God's holding your hand? You ever think about Him holding yours? I, I did. So he grins it off and he says, Generation Rest needed to know this history and this promise. In just a short time, they were about to do the very thing the previous generation was too scared to do. Well, I think about the poem, you know, footsteps in the sand, yeah. when there's only one set. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, there's no so only God one one set of foot one set of footprints because God was carrying you, you know. Yeah. And, and we forget that at times, but I think we see it a lot more. I, I was noticing uh, Sun Monday when we were having the service of celebration, the number of people that were re emphasizing that God has cared them. All right. Yeah, Theo was a big man, but guess what? As large as he was, God still carried him through, uh, carried him through Vietnam. Even though I walked through the valley of the shadows of death, yeah. he carried him as a deputy sheriff by himself on a night watch. Who's who's got your back? And so he was aware of that. He. He and I visited when, when he was still cognizant enough to know what was going on, aware enough. He was uh, in the hospital. We visited him. What did you answer his questions about? Can you remember a bully, a big bully in your past? I remember groups of bullies. I don't <laughs> Group, know. Really <laughs> groups of bullies. <laughs> mean girls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and it's amazing. Has there ever been any time there weren't bullies? No. no. Now, there are times in our lives when they're not bullies, but right. in our world, it's our world. What is, what is the news? The news is about bullies. Yeah. What they're wanting to do to the rest of the world and conquer it. Uh, has there ever been things in your life that you did not do because of fear? Do what? It, what? What? You know, be, you can be honest. Be open. Is what? What did you not do because of fear? I was afraid to continue with my education once I got the first degree. I thought I would never be able to accomplish the next one, and I would have been. Yeah, that's what I thought at the time. I was afraid to change jobs. I'd been a teacher forever, and then all yeah. of a sudden I was going to be helping people and doing stuff that did not require me to sit to be behind a desk in a classroom. I, I, I left Little Rock and went to be the director of the Education Renewal Zone. And that was frightening because I'm thinking, 
what if I'm not successful with this? What if I fail? What if I but, mess up? It was all those fears. But it, but it, but he asked the question: Has there been things in your life you did not do? Oh, because of fear. No, I pretty much do. <laughs> I got a leg to prove it. Well, I, I, I mean, you know. Breaks up dog fights. Yeah. You <laughs> so I mean, but, but, but I, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, I've had, I've seen people not go into professions for the fear of, of that profession. It was the fear of it. All right. And not go there. They wanted to take it. So they take an easier route to go where they're going. All right. And so that's it. Name a person in your life that instilled courage in you. My mother, of course. Oh. My husband. Now we got we only got about fifteen minutes left, so we won't, <laughs> yeah. the list can go on and on and on. But no, I'm joking. We are here as long as we need to be. But that's think about it. How, who's instilled in your life? Who, what was in your mind when you think about it? Who instilled in your life? You know. Well. Was it a teacher? Well, teacher, yeah, but yeah. but back to me changing that job, it was my husband that told me, you know, you can do this. I mean, go he told for you it. you could do it. Yeah, go for it. And yeah. but he was always encouraging me to do things that. Yeah. It, but I also relied on him too. I knew he was telling me the truth. Good. Yeah. Well, I was the other way around on the farm. I was growing up, and my dad always had me doing things. I had to deliver calves and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. and I would say something to my dad, well, why don't you help me do this? He said, I've already done it, and that's your time to learn. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well and good, you know, that sort of thing. So, well, I think, of course, as, as far as Christian faith, I've always said, of course, they've heard me talking about my grand, uh, grandmother Parker, you know, she always told us the story, but also my aunt. And she really had, she married when she was 14, okay? Wow. And, then, you know, it's a long time ago. Yeah. And her husband, uh, his name is Rick, I believe, I maybe I believe Rick. And he was, you know, but he, he didn't provide for him very well. And regardless of what happened in her life, she was always still at the church. And she was always praising God. We did, and she had a lot of terrible things. Lost her son. She lost her house because her daughter went in and forced her name. You know, forced her name. She didn't have a place to live. Just out in California, you know. And you know, but she still never, uh -huh. she never wavered she her never faith. Wavered. Huh? She never, her faith never wavered. Never wavered. She just wavered. What, what, what she would say is, in spite of what you've done, I still love the Lord. Oh yeah. yeah. And so that's that's, that's, that's always it. been my. As far as the Christian faith, so know, uh -huh. who encouraged you your life? Who instilled courage in you? Mostly the ones who saw the greatest potential. Well, I know that, but I mean, any any particular things. For instance, can you imagine Tom Weir at a wedding saying to me, "I have a church that needs you." <laughs> Joe, I thought I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he encouraged me to go into the ministry. But guess what? I was 40 years going there. When I was 13 years old, I told the Lord, this is the direction I'm going. Yes, Lord, you've called me. What did I do? <laughs> I'm like the Israelites. I wandered in the wilderness for 40 years thinking I couldn't do that. I had to do something else. I wanted to be a chemical engineer. I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to be something. But God says, here. And all of a sudden, God spoke through Tom to get my attention. Yeah. And that's it. So that was an encouragement for me. All right. And, and that was, but I also had a, I had a calculus teacher in college. Lurleen Stewart was an absolute jewel. <laughs> and she put up with a bunch of, because there were a lot of vets coming home and back in this, you know, it was back in the 50s. And she was an encourager. And I would be over in the grill, and Joe can tell you about the grill, all right? I'd be over at the grill having a malt and a, and a grilled cheese. And Miss Stewart would come by and said, Bob Marble, you need to come to my office because you made a mistake on this particular equation. Okay. She encouraged me, all right? Uh, and her encouragement got me really into math more than I was already into it, all right? I mean, I wound up taking applications of differential equations. 
Uh, and I, my book was about that thick, and I gave it to our daughter who teaches calculus now. And the book that has <laughs> application of different equations is about this thick now. But they, it's all still says the same stuff. But there was an encouragement there, and, and we have that. How many of you were encouraged to play sports by your coaches? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wrong crowd. <laughs> This is not a bad story. Okay, uh, 1974, dialysis yep. was just getting started. I remember just those days. Just got funded by the government. You know, there were very few centers anywhere. And I mean, they actually had machines and, you know, gas station back room, you know. <laughs> but at any rate, um, and my hospital, Lamar, had started a, a center thing for children. And and then it took so long for the money to start rolling in, they weren't sure it was going to, so they, there was talk that it would be shut down. So several, they didn't have very many staff, but several of them left <clears throat> to get other jobs that were afraid. They told sure. them not to have a job. Um, salary. So my, I was working in the ICU, and you know, it was just talking along. And my, a friend that I had made just by going to lunches and stuff there, she called me and she said, we're going to have an opening here in dialysis, and nobody wanted to work dialysis. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't put literally you couldn't pay people to do it. And the word was, oh, the patients they throw up all the time. You know, that was the big thing. They're always throwing up. Well, nobody wanted to work where everybody threw up. You know, <laughs> anyway, right. she told me, and she said, uh, uh, you know, there's an opening here, and well, maybe the hours were a little better or something. I forget, but anyway. So she mentioned me to the doctor, and this new doctor had come to town, and nobody liked him. He was he was kind of stern in a way. He was kind of smarty, and he was he didn't know how to make friends with nurses. He would write nurses up like crazy. If you weighed the baby just a little, you know, half an ounce wrong, he knew it, and he'd write you up. So nobody wanted to work with him. Well, he, I mean, he was okay to me. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to. But anyway, it didn't matter. I just said okay. And later, uh, but, I, but I didn't know if I could do it. And the first day, that friend, we had like four or five different machines. Each one was different. They had been donated from this one and from that one. And she took me to each one and she said, now here, you take this spoon and you put this here and you punch this button. Okay, let's go to this next one. And that by the end of the day, I said, uh -uh, save my spot. I'm going back. I'm going back to the ICU. The doctor had come in. Yeah. And he said, uh, well, how's it going? I said, well, I can't do this. There, there, there's no, mm -mm, no. <laughs> and, you know, and she felt bad. My friend had felt bad. But it showed me all those different machines, which each one, you, you just can't imagine. I don't know without it. I don't know of another example. But at any rate, he sat me down. And he said this and that and the other, and it's going to be okay, and you know, I'm going to take it. Soon. And he said, you know, the truth is, he said, uh, when I heard that you were willing, he said, I didn't want to let you, I didn't want to lose you from the ICU, but at the same time, I had to think of my own unit, my dialysis unit, I was going to be in charge of, and I would rather have you there. I'd rather lose you to the ICU and have you there. And that made me feel so good. So, so he, he so he, he encouraged you. See, yeah. that would. Yeah, I want to. Oh no, I don't want to. Okay. Well, but you learned there of what you found out going from ICU to doing dialysis. I remember when it all got started. I remember. But think about it. What did? And he asked the question. What did the generation rest learn from their experience at the Red Sea? Did they not get that same thing? In other words, they were encouraged. You know, yeah, can you realize they thought they were going to drown, right? They were. That's right. They were afraid to cross over. And I was. And then, and so they were encouraged. And so, by the same token, if you finding that they found it, Moses encouraged them, and they went across. What steps can you take to personally instill the kind of confidence in ourselves? Or others that Moses gave to Generation Rest. What 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 is it? What is it about? What do we do? A lot of us have an inner dialogue telling us we're not good enough, and we won't be able to be good enough and do the things that we think. 
And if we could just realize and think about how we think about other people being good enough and really we're the same. And so we got to cut that dialogue where we don't feel good enough to do what we need to do. Well, really good teachers are encouragers. You were talking about yes. parent teachers. You yes. do it all the time for us in yes. Bell, you know, I mean, doesn't you? Yes. Because yes. yes. sometimes it's like <laughs> several of us can't remember which hands were right. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, or across the room. Yeah. Across the room. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say one. Really good teachers are always encouragers. That's what I'm saying. And they help you. They're smart enough to know when to help and when not to. Yeah. And they create good good encouragers create or arrange the circumstances where you can succeed. That's right. That's right. You were going to say, Joy? I think patience. Oh, yeah. Very important because it may not always work the first time. And we said, patience. Thank you. We so practice is what my grandmother used to tell me in your patience, possess your soul. <laughs> and, and that's it. And, and we think about it. But how many, I, I interviewed a prisoner down in Cummins years ago, back in the 70s. Do you know what he said? I'm right where my father said yeah, I would, would be. be. Yeah. Was that an, wow. can, can, can you imagine that? He had that inner dialogue his can, whole life. Can, can you imagine, to me, that that hit me like a baseball bat. I can't even imagine yeah. the well, father said saying in his that. book when he was talking about the bullies. Yeah. He said, I was always taught, go to the other side of the street, avoid yeah. trouble, don't yeah. get involved. Yeah. That was what he was faced with right there. And well, he was faced with. My father was the kind of person that if you told him he couldn't do something, it made him try it twice as hard. <laughs> but I was not that kind of person, but he thought I was. And he told me, you're going to fail that driver's test. You're oh. going to fail that driver's test. I failed the driver's test. I was 21 years old before I got my driver's license. I, I didn't think I was smart enough to pass that driver's test. That was just, I was driving illegally. I'm telling you, I was driving since I was 12. <laughs> well, I was too, but I drove. A, I started out driving a tractor. Tractors, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I had to go get the truck and take it places. Well, I did that too. Oh, you know. well, well, anyway. I, Daddy would take me to go get to pick up something in the shop, and I would drive the other day. I didn't have a driver's license. So, well, behind me, just drive behind me. So, <laughs> is, is Mark Davis right that God had it rigged for the Israelites to cross in? To the promise. With right? well, Moses' yeah. help, yeah. they definitely. Well, he, yeah, he knows everything. Of course but so he had it rigged. It was rigged, right? It was rigged. Yeah. The only, yeah. And so that's it. Well, I've enjoyed today. I hope you have too. Yes. And so we will. Uh, we'll go to go to the next chapter, which will be. Uh, let's go. <laughs> chapter seven next week. And so uh, we'll Kathy see. Kathy Sue's not feeling well, so uh, Kathy Sue, I'd like for us to be we might remember her. All right. Let's. Any other prayer requests? We had a prayer request for Kathy Sue, who's not feeling well. Any others? Donna. Yeah, Donna. 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 Who else? Be with Candy in her mind because she's now. Having to exist as a woman. That candy. <laughs> that candy. 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 Candy, <laughs> candy Pierce. Yes. Do you realize what Theo's names were? No. Theo yes. David. Oh, wow. Yes. And his last name Pierce, which is a derivative of rock. Oh, wow. He was a rock. So it's interesting. Let's pray for those that are in our hearts and in our minds today. Almighty God, we give thanks this day as we come together and try our best to find out more about what you tell us in your word. And as Moses did so much for the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy, and we're finding out all new things, we ask you to continue to enlighten us, continue to encourage us, and continue to walk in this direction. And while we're at it, Lord, we lift up Kathy Sue, and we lift up Donna, all of those, and like Candy, that are going through issues in their lives right now that need your strength, and need your circling of grace. Be with them all and be with us as we leave this place and we'll return, Lord, as you have with us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.